Lisa Winkar, Britain's favourite daytime jock and currently holding down job as uh, head of training at Radio HMV, has been talking to Peter Stringfellow. Here is part one of his interview. Peter Stringfellow, welcome. Ah, uh, my pleasure. My Hi pleasure. there. Stringfellow's the name. Was it simply the name? Well, you mean, uh, was I born with it? Shares 60% of the letters of the word nightclub. Is that why you named your club Stringfellows? Okay, no, let me explain that. When I first started in 1960, number one, Stringfellow didn't have any glamour in those days. Apart Some... from having written uh, Hiawatha. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And the different range of people you attract, a huge range of people, don't you? I do that deliberately. Yeah, from because... Sloan's, you got the Jet Set, uh, yeah. rock stars, the Blunties, the Ciders, the Riders and the Hex, they're all there. Yeah, I mean, Why? you know, it, my, my door is very wide. If you make the effort and you look good, you can come in, because basically we're all of one type. But you see a Plunty come into the club, he's looking a little bit down. Would you actually go up to him? Yes, I do that. What would you say to a plunter you came in? I just say, "Hey, nice to have you in. Welcome to the club. Let me get you a drink." Once they're in the club, I look after it. What kind of cuisine do you give them? Well, in the early days, we used to have, of course, like everywhere else in London, you had your menu in French. You had your menu in. Oh yeah. Do you like uh, violin players? Do I like who? Well, you say you had your menu in. Are violin players the sort of people that you actually have in? V Vinnie Jones comes in and he's a great guy. He's in it violent. You just let him sing again. He's not a violin player, is he? No, no. Would, you, do you have, would you have you had your menu in and Stefan Grappelli say? Yeah, why not? If you came back as an article of clothing in the next life, what would it be? Oh, that's an easy one. It would be white. It would be slightly frilly, not too big, and it's known as a G-string. Girls. And that would be fine. would you like to wear it? That depends entirely. I mean, I wouldn't be seeing too many faces, would I, down there, so... <laughs> You'd be looking out at your clients and giving them a <laughs> wink and saying, well done, mate, put another fiver in there. I certainly wouldn't want to be a shoe, I'll tell you that. Yeah, no, you wouldn't want to be a shoe. Cotton or nylon or... Oh, now we get into it. I'd, I'd be quite happy to be a little cotton one, because I like cotton. I think that's Cotton is nice. But, you absorbent. know, a slight little silky one with a little bit frilly edges, that'd be nice. Well, Hung up on a bedpost yeah. and getting a little bit excited about the next time you're going to be worn. Absolutely. That's right. what I would do. So that's what you'd like to be. Seriously, even if you only had a very limited consciousness. You know, we, we had a bit of a conversation last night in the club about this. And yeah, uh, I can the imagine. The guy was saying yeah. he'd like to be a, a woman for a couple of weeks. I said, I uh, wouldn't. Yeah. And all the guys, with the exception of me, would like to be a girl for a week. And you said, guys, you can be women, I'd be a G-string. <laughs> well, actually, I kept that one quiet, love, you know, because mm. the one I was wearing at the time was getting a bit tight. But you wouldn't want to be a G-string on yourself, would oh, you? no, absolutely no. not. You want to be right up in the soft, warm recesses of a twat. <laughs> you can't actually say that, can you? Let's be honest about <laughs> yeah, this. Let's, let's use the right words. Let's use the word vagina, not, not twat. Just time for Newsbeat to uh, have a quick go on this Nirvana game. Please, do you want to play? Yeah, OK, OK, hang on. So everybody is basically, it's a board game, Nirvana board game. Everybody is Kurt Cobain. You're a little red Cobain, I'm a little yellow one. Let me shake. Here we go. Okay, now I pick up a chance card. And it says, run out of smack, go on stage in a wheelchair. Okay, okay you'll go. All right, there you go. Blue card. Record rubbish fourth album, release under name of Stiltskin. Hey, I hope I don't get this card. It says, buy a big new house with a granny flat. Uh-oh. Just playing the uh, Nirvana board game here. It's your go, Peter. What's okay, your card then. say? All right. <clears throat> uh, receive phone call from Eddie Vedder. Blow head off with gun. Okay, my go. Mm. So you're out for a round. Mm. Okay, mine says, fake suicide to escape pain of fame. Live in hiding and maybe, just maybe, consider coming back. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, go on, mate. Oh, go on, come back. Oh, please, please come Can back. Somebody interviewed Stephen Hawking. Yes. Um, have you ever met the guy? No, but I, I rate him highly. One okay. of, of my heroes. Well, listen, um, I've got a clip of that because this guy knew I was interviewing you and he asked Stephen Hawking about you. Do you want to hear what he said? I'd love to, yeah. Okay, hang on. Let me just work. It's, got it, on the, this. it's got it on a little dictaphone. Wait for this. Here we go. Peter Stringfellow is a public menace and, in my view should be excluded from society. <laughs> Are you sure that wasn't Doctor Who? You mean a Dalek or a something? A Dalek? Was yeah. That, well, it's no, on one of these little dictaphone things. Yeah, no, no, Stephen, uh, I'm, I know exactly that's how he has to speak, but uh, I don't care. The man is a wonderful intellect. He's a great... And you I'd know what he said? I'd love to sit with a few hours and have a chat with that guy. Because he's glam, isn't he? 
Well, he's, he's a wonderful person. You've got to, his sexuality is his mind. That man absolutely. has got to be, mind. to be a girl and listen to him talk about the universe and, and his theories on the string uh, theory. By the way, there's such a thing as a string theory, you know, in the universe. Hey, ma maybe that was his little concession the to you. bubble theory? Yeah, bubble theory. Well, if, just well, you're not called Bubble Fellow. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Certainly wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be a top club <laughs> in London. Absolutely, it? Bubble Fellows. <laughs> bubble fellows. <laughs> <laughs> weird. But no, I mean, uh, uh, the, kids, the, yeah. the guy, the guy, the guy, let's face it, Hawk. Yeah, I suppose what you're saying is his brain is is uh, the, is the centre. You got to look at this. That man is in the situation he is. Yeah, he's definitely that. Yeah. He cannot move a thing, and he speaks through his. Um, he's the last the machine on his throat. And yet, it wasn't so long ago that he, in the state he's in, got divorced and married his nurse. My God. He's a kind of like a Meccano stud. But he's living. He's still doing it. He's yeah, not giving up. And he's, absolutely. I'd love to be in his brain for a couple of days. When Jesus. I say I'd like to be Stephen Hawking, I'm not, I'm not being terrible and saying I'd like Hawking. to be with, with his terrible uh, Hawking. problem. Yeah. But have his brain for a couple of uh, days, a couple of weeks. Have I'd his brain it. in the club yeah. and, and leave him outside. Well, I don't know if one could do that. Yeah. It's been an absolutely massive pleasure. Very My nice pleasure, of you. Wayne. I've enjoyed it too. Okay. A very, very... Therapeutic is the word. Excellent. Hey, Wayne, say hello to my girlfriend, Christine. Okay, this is for Peter Stringfellow's brand new flesh tube. <laughs> Christine, has she got the month uh, September written on her head? No, no, she's all right. She kept going back to New York and find it very difficult to live with me. I don't know why, because I'm so easy. Yeah, you're a very easygoing guy. Yeah. We know that on 1FM. And I tell you what, Christine, if you don't know that, then you're a bigger fool than I think you are already just for being a woman. How's that? Um... And uh, you may recall earlier in the year there was a strike on the BBC, quite a big one. News operations were primarily affected. So I thought I'd call Tory Central Office and uh, say, hey look, is there anyone who can say something for tomorrow's news? And amazingly, they said, yes, yeah, we know someone who can say something that will be relevant for the news in 24 hours' time. And they gave me John Gummer's phone number. Hello? Hello, is that Mr Gummer? Yes. I don't know if you're aware of the situation, but basically there may be industrial action tomorrow which uh, threatens to undermine the news bulletins, obviously. Yes. And in order to supermount the trouble, we're trying to record as much of the news as possible today. Of course, I understand. So, if there's anything uh, you want to say which you feel will be extant in 24 hours... Well, I think the thing that will be extant is the, um, uh, the major issue about vetoing. Right, well, can we record a statement on that now for tomorrow's news? Yeah. Okay. Over and over again, Britain needs to have her veto because everybody then knows that when things of great national importance comes up, she's not pushed to the brink. That's why the veto's vital. Now, if it's going to go high in the bulletin, it will probably benefit from a swipe at one of the opposition parties. Uh, right. I'm... Um the British people must be appalled that the Liberal Democrats are so split over the veto. It's quite clear that the major spokesmen like Sir David Steele want to get rid of Britain's veto. We can't have that. I think the Liberals are selling Britain down the river. Uh, would you like to perhaps put out something about the Labour Party? You've mentioned the Liberals okay. there. Uh, something about the Labour, if you could sort of give them a bit of a wigging. <laughs> right. Yeah. Labour has uh, signed up with the European Socialist Manifesto. So they've joined the Liberals on saying that Britain can be members of the European community without any veto over the matters that really matter. Right, now let's just look at the possibility that during the course of the day Labour have reversed their attitude on the veto. What do you say then? Well, if Labour's now pretending it, <laughs> it wants to keep the veto, that's the seventh change on Europe that it's had in almost as many years. Uh, now, if it says it wants to keep the uh, British veto, then how can it go on being part of the Socialist Union of Parties? It doesn't stand up. This Labour Party will say anything to get a vote. So I've got a letter here from Gavin Cash of St Neots in Cambridgeshire, who says, Dear Chris, I know you don't usually do requests, but I feel that this story will make you do it. I'm a musician, though more than 70% of my income comes from the guitar shop I run in the arcade. I play the keyboards. We sell them. 
My main public performance outlet is through the two-piece dance combo I comprise with my business partner, Andy Everett. Gigging extensively up to four nights a week throughout East Anglia, we are known as LoveNet. About a year ago, I was enjoying a quiet morning in the shop, working out a variation on Huey Lewis Happy to be Stuck with You, with Bossa Nova setting and tremolo, when I noticed the slender stocking legs of a quiet-looking girl with glasses, but sexy like the effect that glasses can have on Kim Bassinger's face when they make her look sexy underneath in some films. Our shop is in the basement, which is why I saw her legs. To be honest, it was not the first time I had seen her, but it had never struck me before how pretty she was, but now it did, and my left hand kept laying the walking bass down again and again, while my jaw dropped open because I was suddenly really into her look. I am actually quite shy, but I had to get her attention. I turned the volume up and hit the bass riff with both hands. She slowed down and actually stopped. The thudding was incredibly loud, but sexy like the relax riff. I was jumping up and down with the effort while Andy appeared in the doorway with a puzzled face. But suddenly, it was another face I was looking at. Hers, looking through our pavement window. She was smiling. She raised her finger to her lips and went, shh, and laughed and walked across to a bit where I couldn't see. I knew I had to meet her, but I didn't know quite what I would do. I was sure my best chance of a pull would be on stage because some girls had said that I reminded them of Jeff Lynne. I went through a month of expecting her to be at every gig until I got so used to it I thought she wouldn't come but she did as soon as I thought she wouldn't on the next gig. It was a 500 head Christmas bash with a laser light show and we were top of the bill. We'd been playing for half an hour when I saw her on the floor. She had some real nice twists in her body. I nodded to Andy and we hit the plan which was to pull out of Matthew Wilder's Break My Stride, and then Andy shouted, Hey girls, you like a man with a moustache? I keyed in a sound effect of a huge crowd roar and slowly nodded. I could feel my huge moustache nodding with the rest of my head. Then I slammed into my thunder bass riff. The volume was bloody loud, and I felt like I was growing bigger with each beat. The bass drum was cracking the speakers, and slowly everybody in the hall stopped, and soon they were all staring at me because I was starting to sing. This is our song, I roared. I set the keyboard on repeat and started chanting the word love very loud and very fast. I jumped off the stage and stomped rhythmically towards her, increasing my voice volume. Suddenly, I was surrounded by faces, but the only sound I could hear was my own love song, which I changed to a throaty growl as I now rolled along the floor. I am a love worm. I am a love worm. I repeated and writhed around until I was right at her feet. I slowly looked up, and her lovely eyes were laughing along with the rest of her face, and she clapped. She kept saying, You're a very funny little man. The keyboard stopped. But I really do love you, I said, with the mic on, standing up and looking at her because she was taller than me. It's just that I can't say it very easily. She suddenly looked very different, serious but gentle with a small smile. This was the best look I'd ever had from a woman. I wanted it to last like a sustained chord. She opened her mouth to speak, but as soon as she had said the word I... She was pierced by a spear of frozen liquid waste from an aeroplane toilet facility that plunged through the roof into her head. The expression of polite horror on her face as it fell past mine, plus the sound of air whistling out the top of her head, made me feel really crap. But Chris, you would remind me of that month of happy longing if you would play Derek Jameson's Christmas record, Yes, Virginia. It's the only record I listen to now, and it cheers me up because of its happy message. Yours, Gavin Cash. Gavin, it's a pleasure. How sad the world would be if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as sad as if there were no little girls. There would be no childlike faith, no poetry, no beauty to make bearable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in what we feel and see. The eternal light with which children fill the world would be put out. Not believe in Santa Claus. You might as well not believe in angels. Did Gavin, you ever see fairies? Dancing thanks for your letter, Gavin. Wall. I'm sorry we haven't got time to play more of that, but uh, no it is the last show in the series. There. But I'm delighted to have at last Nobody been able to Santa fit in a request. And Gavin says, P.S. I wasn't invited to the funeral, but I hid in the trees in the churchyard and pretended to myself I had been her husband. 
I did this by shutting my eyes and wanking.